joining the Four Seasons Gardening Winter Webinar Series. And today we're going to be covering naughty, nasty, and simply annoying plants. Uh, my name is Rhonda Furry. I'm the horticulture educator covering Fulton Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell. I'm actually not the state coordinator anymore, even though it lists that on, on the slide there. So today we're going to cover a lot of different types of plants, and I'm going to put them into several different categories. And we're going to talk about how the, the program, uh, or sorry, the, the plants are maybe poisonous, how they might sting you or stick you or be allergenic or, or cause some kind of dermatitis. Uh, I'm going to cover some plants that are indoors and also some plants that are out. And I'm going to start by, and uh, just stop here just a minute, I did provide several different handouts. Uh, you could have printed out the uh, PowerPoint slides that you're seeing here. I also did a handout that goes through um, each of the slides individually and gives a little bit of detail about each of the plants and some of these toxicity uh, ratings. So um, hopefully you have that in front of you. That will help. And then I also provided a handout that Candace Miller, a uh, horticulture educator in the north uh, west corner of the state, uh, she did a really nice handout on plants that cause skin irritation. So those are all available to you. So I'm going to start out with, I, I like this ranking system that University of California has uses, and so I'm going to do that um, today using this uh, ranking system. I'm going to cover first the plants that um, affect your skin. When I think of something being poisonous, uh, it could be poisonous to us in three ways, really. Uh, one is it could be a stomach poison. Usually when we think of poison, we think of something that we eat that's going to poison us internally, so a stomach poison. But then another way that a, a plant could be uh, toxic to us would be through the skin or a dermal or dermatitis type of a poison uh, or maybe into the eyes. So either stomach or dermatitis or the third way would be that it could be inhaled. And then I'm going to cover at the end just a few of the ones that could actually stick you or prick you or, or poke you in some way. So um, those are the categories that I'm going to be covering today. In each of the slides, as, you, um, as I go along up in the upper right corner, I'm going to have a code there that talks about what type of uh, injury it's cause, it can cause, and, and so uh, you should be able to follow along. And I'm going to cover the ones that are skin irritants first, the ones that can cause dermatitis. And I really I decided I would start right off with poison ivy uh, because that is the most uh, um, common, one of the most common questions we get about poisonous plants, of course. And many people are allergic to poison ivy and, and have uh, had problems with that rash. And then I'll also cover uh, some other plants that you're seeing listed here. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, it, it really just kind of mentioned that um, you can never say never, and uh, everybody reacts differently. And so even though one person might not react to a plant in one way, uh, somebody else might, and uh, everybody has different uh, reactions. Uh, so I'm going to cover just kind of the general, what the literature uh, talks about, and just remembering that everybody uh, is a little bit different. So let's start right off with poison ivy. Lots of different <laughs> misconceptions out there about poison ivy. Uh, poison ivy, the way I always try to talk about it, of course, is leaves of three, let it be, uh, is what we uh, mentioned many times. And the reason is, is as you look at that picture there, um, there are three leaflets. This is actually a compound leaf, and so there are uh, that whole structure there, all three of those leaflets together is one leaf. Sometimes those three leaflets uh, individually will have those little cutouts like you see that might look like a mitten. Sometimes they're not. They're just completely smooth and uh, around uh, the edges. It, it usually has a little bit of a redness to that stem, uh, but it does vary um, from time to time. Sometimes you'll also see um, little bumps on those leaves, which are uh, like galls that uh, form on the leaves in a way. And so it can have different uh, looks of the leaves, but there's always going to be three leaflets. Um, it is a plant in the cashew family, and actually poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac are all in the cashew family. Uh, they all have this uracil oil. Um, which can cause skin irritation. Even the cashew actually has it, but it's on in the, the, the hole or the, the outer um, covering of that uh, cashew, which you don't usually get. You, they usually will take that outer shell off before you get it. 
Um, these plants, the poison ivy, typically are considered vines. They can climb very high in the trees. They're actually beautiful plants, especially in the fall when they turn a really bright red. The flowers aren't very obvious. They're very small, um, kind of green, very inconspicuous. And then the fruits aren't real showy either. They're kind of a whitish, and uh, but they are very useful. Uh, this is a native plant, and the fruit is um, used by our birds and, and eaten by wildlife. We usually will find this mostly in woods. Uh, and of course, like I said, the birds can spread those seeds. Just a couple pictures here. The vines can get quite uh, large. Uh, you can see on the left there, that's actually a, a vine of poison ivy that's attached to the tree. I often will notice that poison ivy does attach to the tree with those aerial roots like that. Um, next to it, kind of growing up, you can see some honeysuckle vine, actually, that are not attached to the uh, tree. And then sometimes you can see Virginia creeper or maybe wild grape. Uh, Virginia creeper is often attached to the tree, the same as poison ivy. Um, but uh, typically the grape vines do not attach. So if you see a vine attached to the tree like that, um, it's usually, you know, to me, I'm going to start to think poison ivy, although it could be um, Virginia creeper or, or another vine. Uh, the middle picture, you can see that poison ivy, uh, as I said, you know, usually is a vine that's going to grow way up into the tree. Uh, but it can also take other forms. Uh, sometimes it grows almost like a little tree. Sometimes it grows almost like a little shrub. And so uh, it can be confusing sometimes to uh, try to identify it. But again, uh, those leaves of three, you'll, you'll start to, to recognize those. On the right's the fruit, and uh, you can see that it's just a, a, not a, anything spectacular, but it is a very useful wildlife food. For poison ivy, uh, the most common mistake I think people make um, and the most common comment I get is um, that they think that Virginia creeper, which is the upper picture here, uh, the plant with one, two, three, four, five, six leaflets there, uh, it can have um, five to seven leaflets actually, Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper is not considered a poisonous plant, although again, like I said, I never say never, so some people might be sensitive to uh, Virginia creeper. But in general, we do not consider Virginia creeper to be a poisonous plant. I often get people telling me that poison ivy is the plant on the on the um, bottom, as you can see, circled on the bottom of this picture with the leaflets of three. And then a lot of people think that the Virginia creeper is poison oak. And actually, that's not true at all. Uh, poison oak is very similar to poison ivy. Uh, poison oak actually does not grow in Illinois. It is in one county, way in southern Illinois, is where it has been found. Um, but it typically is not going to be found in, in Illinois. Uh, poison oak looks looks similar to poison ivy. Um, it has the leaflets of three. Uh, but when I have seen poison oak out west, um, its leaflets are smaller and they're more uh, shaped almost like a white oak, um, just like the name poison oak. And so, um, you know, typically what you're going to see here, obviously, is the is the poison ivy. There, Virginia creeper, which is the one that a lot of people um, confuse it with, is again this plant that has five to seven leaflets. Uh, it is a, a woody perennial in the grape family. Um, there's also another plant that's similar to it called Boston ivy. Uh, they have these little suction cups. Um, on the vines that will adhere it to a tree or even to a brick house, for example. Uh, the stems, um, you can see, are five to eight branch with those suction cup type tendrils. Uh, the leaves are uh, palmate, again, with those um, typically five, but as we counted in the last picture, there were uh, six, and they're about one to four inches long, which is about the same size as a leaflet of a poison ivy. Um, not very showy flowers or fruit, but it can get quite uh, large, um, similar to poison ivy. And the uh, color is very similar as well. On the right picture here on the top, you can see the Virginia creeper in the fall. It's a beautiful bright red, uh, very similar to poison ivy. That's actually in one of my trees in my woods. And um, it, it's one of the first um, 
plants to full color and so it really shows up up in in the tops of the trees so it's actually quite pretty uh, in the bottom picture there is actually when i was uh, uh, boating on the spoon river uh, or even on the illinois river i spent a lot of time on those rivers uh, we see lots of uh, vines actually growing along uh, the rivers there and this is a virginia creeper that's completely covered uh, some of those uh, plants there along the river so they can be quite aggressive in, in some cases I wanted to cover just a few myths of poison ivy because there's so much um, misinformation out there. Um, the first one here is that poison oak causes blisters while poison ivy causes a milder skin rash. And that's just not true. Poison ivy and poison oak cause very similar uh, types of rashes. It depends on the person and the amount of exposure and how, what kind of a, a rash you're going to get. Um, all three of these plants that I show here, uh, poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac, all cause similar types of rash um, in, in, in most people, actually. As I said, poison oak's not in Illinois, but um, there is some um, new research out, and, and there's some kind of disagreement a bit among the scientific world uh, between poison ivy and poison oak and, and, and thinking that poison oak might actually be an ecotype of poison ivy. So regardless, they're very similar and we want to try to avoid those leaves of three. Um, but just knowing that uh, uh, just because it has a different type of rash doesn't make, mean that it came from a different plant. The poison ivy myth number two is that um, the fluid from the blisters can spread the rash to other body parts or to other people. And that's actually not true either. Um, it is spread by the oils, not by the, the water that's in the blisters. It cannot move in our body, uh, in the blood. Um, and so it really, you have to have exposure to those oils in order um, to get the rash if you're allergic to it. Um, and so, you know, even though you blister up and maybe um, you touch somebody with that, um, you, you should not be spreading the rash in that way to somebody else or to the other parts of your body. Uh, myth number three is that some individuals are so sensitive that they can get a rash simply from being near it and they don't even have to touch it. Um, actually, you do have to touch it in some way. It's spread by that oil, as I said. Uh, but the oil could be in many different places and hidden in, in, in some ways. Uh, my sister is one who is extremely, extremely uh, sensitive to poison ivy, as she is sensitive to another plant we're going to cover a bit later. And, uh, and it does seem like she can just be in the area and get it. Uh, but most likely, you know, she's touched a plant, she's touched her clothes that um, touched the plant, maybe petted the dog that touched the plant, um, there's lots of different ways that you can get um, the oil spread around. Um, and, and the other myth really is that I, I'm, you know, I used to say this when I was oh. a, small, a small child. I used to say that I was immune to poison ivy. Um, and actually, no one is immune. It's just that you have different sensitivities, and those do seem to change with age. And so um, I did start actually uh, getting the rash from poison ivy when I was probably about 18, and now I can. I don't get it every year because I'm pretty careful, but um, I could get it you know, if I get uh, those oils on me. And then the final myth that I'll cover today uh, just for poison ivy is uh, that the rash will appear within minutes after touching the plant. Uh, again, everybody's different, and so I'm not going to uh, make a, a statement uh, in general here, but um, usually it takes uh, 12 to 48 hours before the rash appears once you've uh, made contact with those oils. Uh, you can wash the oils off before they uh, penetrate the skin enough uh, to cause the rash, just simply using cold water and soap. There are many different uh, preventatives out there. Uh, that uh, really are used as an IV block, um, different brands that are out there that I've used. And um, obviously the best ways to prevent um, poison ivy uh, injury is to not touch the plant. But if you um, are going to be in an area that has poison ivy, you might try one of the poison ivy blocks. It does just kind of coat the skin. 
I have had success for myself and my family when we were actually out geocaching and and we got into some poison ivy because we had to go get that little geocache. <laughs> I could explain that later. Um, but anyway, we did go back right out from the woods and go wash off ourselves. And, and none of us um, got poison ivy that day. And we definitely touched it. So uh, within 30 minutes to about four hours, try to get those oils washed off and, and also off of your clothes. Uh, just to uh, uh, go back here, um, make sure that if you do get the rash, I just want to just make the statement uh, to treat a rash quickly. I'm not going to talk about treatment here. I'm not a doctor. Um, but obviously, if you get a very severe rash, make sure you do go to the doctor. Uh, controlling poison ivy, gets a lot, I get lots of questions about that. Um, you can hand pull it and obviously be very careful. Uh, if it's just kind of a little seedling uh, growing in my flower beds, I like to take maybe, um, you know, like a, a bread sack and put it on my hand and then um, pull it and then turn the bread sack inside out. And then I don't touch that plant at all and I can discard it. Um, you can also use other types of protective clothing and gloves. Uh, if it is growing up a tree or you can find that main stem, I think one of the best ways to treat it is to cut or just sever that main branch or that main stem and then to treat the cut surface right away. Um, it will re-sprout if you don't uh, cut, treat that cut surface. So similar to the way that we do other cut surface treatments, uh, you could treat it with uh, by painting that um, area with 100% uh, glyphosate or, or Roundup product. Um, there are some 2,4-D and triclopyr products. Tordon actually works in that way as well. Um, just to be very careful and just treat that uh, cut surface that you um, just made. Uh, new shoots, um, you can cut. You can also treat those new shoots. And if it's a systemic product like Roundup that moves in the plant, as does 2,4-D and triclopyr, uh, then it could move down and, and kill the roots as well, which is what you want to do. You can try to treat the foliage if it's growing in other plants, but remember that most of these products um, will kill your desirable plants as well. So it uh, can be very uh, challenging if that poison ivy is growing in other landscape plants. So you have to be very careful uh, in, in dealing with that. So just a couple of tips on, on controlling poison ivy. Moving on then to some other uh, plants that can cause uh, some dermal uh, problems. Uh, moving indoors, actually, to uh, some ficus. Uh, in the mulberry family, we have some house plants, rubber trees, weeping figs, fig plants. Um, they actually do have a, kind of a sap that can cause an irritation or a rash if, on some people if it's handled by your, your um, you know, exposed to your bare skin. I have um, a couple of ficus at home, and I've never had this problem. I've propagated them, I've pruned them, I've been exposed to the sap, and I've, uh, obviously I'm not sensitive to it, but other people might be. So again, it has been uh, reported and, and is listed as a dermal uh, toxin. The other one that uh, you may have growing as an ornamental vine is trumpet creeper. Trumpet creeper is a, a, a native plant here, a, a wonderful pollinator plant. Uh, it is a plant that hummingbirds love. It can be very, very aggressive, has very strong rhizomes in the root system, very deep roots, as you can see here on the slide uh, listed. Um, it's a, a, a woody plant with a very large stem. And uh, the woody vine uh, can grow up to about 30 feet and have about a 7-inch uh, stem, so it can get quite large. The beautiful flowers are orange and kind of a trumpet-shaped, which, again, you'll often see hummingbirds at and other pollinators. And the flowers are there from you know June to September or so. Um, the leaves and the flowers uh, can actually they can uh, cause some skin redness and swelling for some people. Um, and actually, it's interesting, when I was doing the research for this program, um, some um, animal scientists actually call it cow itch, uh, because it, in some cows that are sensitive to trumpet creeper uh, can uh, break out in a rash when they brush up against the leaves. So they, it's been nicknamed a cow itch. Um, it also is one that if for some reason someone were to eat it, um, it could cause some slight toxicity if it was ingested. Uh, so again, um, a trumpet creeper uh, can be a problem for some people. 
There are a couple of bulbs, actually, uh, I'll cover two. Tulip bulbs could be um, included as well, but the hyacinth and the daffodils are the two that I'll cover that have been known to cause uh, dermal problems, especially for florists and people who, uh, you know, the the farmers who are, are really growing these or, or maybe the packers in the uh, that are, are cutting and bunching and packing up, up these bulbs and exposed to the sap. Um, both the, uh, this bulb, the hyacinth bulb, is in the per, uh, perennial bulb in the lily family, obviously a beautiful spring flower, which some of you may uh, see starting to grow out there now. Uh, and um, it... Um, is has these you know the bulb actually has a dry kind of skin like layers on it um, and very fragrant fragrant plant both the bulbs and the plants can be irritating to the skin and uh, I actually when I was a student and when I worked at the University of Illinois in the greenhouse I can remember some of the greenhouse workers developed a sensitivity to hyacinth bulbs over time because they uh, planted them so much that they would have to start wearing gloves when they uh, handled the hyacinth bulb. So, uh, so some people can be sensitive. Similarly, uh, with the daffodil bulbs, again, more of a common uh, problem for people in the florist industry. Uh, the sap from the stems or the bulbs uh, can uh, cause some irritation. And this one's actually called daffodil itch. It is uh, listed in the literature as daffodil itch. It can cause some skin redness and dryness uh, if you are exposed to that sap, uh, maybe even if you pick the flowers. Uh, so the, the again, a perennial, you're all pretty familiar with daffodils. Uh, you may ask if a daffodil uh, has this problem and a, and a narcissus doesn't. Well, it, it really doesn't matter. They're all plants, basically. A uh, narcissus botanical name. Uh, uh, people call it a daffodil. And then jonquil is actually a particular type. So they all have uh, or could potentially cause uh, the daffodil itch. Poinsettia is one that I'm. you can see I'm covering here with the dermal toxins and not as a stomach poison. Um, poinsettia has a bad rap out there and a bad reputation, um, which is actually uh, a myth. Uh, and and it, I think that the poinsettia actually has been studied quite extensively for this. Um, this is a, a plant that's native to Mexico and Central America. It's a beautiful plant when you see it there, as it is um, when we use it, obviously, in our holiday decorations here. Uh, it is in the Spurge family, and I'll mention a, another one in the next slide that's in the Spurge family. Uh, plants in that family have a milky sap, and so that milky sap uh, can cause some latex-type allergies. If you're somebody who's allergic to latex, you might uh, be sensitive to the sap of a, uh, a plant in the Spurge family, like uh, poinsettia. Uh, poinsettia, as most of you probably know, uh, the colors that we're seeing on that are the colored bracts. They're actually modified leaves that uh, change uh, colors when the nights get quite long. And the true flower is actually the little yellow balls that are in the center. Uh, the research has uh, been done, as I said, on how much it would actually take to um, kill a, someone. The, the old story or wife's tale, I guess I would say, is that a child ate a poinsettia leaf and died. Um, the, the thought is now that the child might have had something else, or it could have been sensitive, I guess. But uh, generally, the, the research is that a 50-pound child would have to eat 500 to 600 leaves to have any symptoms at all. So again, usually we consider poinsettia uh, more of a dermal a toxin. The other plant in the Euphorbia uh, genus in the Spurge family is also a tropical. It's a pencil cactus. Uh, I took this picture, I believe, when I was in Texas last fall. Uh, it's a, a really a nice plant, but it also uh, has that milky sap that can cause latex injuries. I cover it because it, um, some people may uh, grow it as a house plant. It grows very well as a house plant. Uh, it just has those pencil-sized kind of green branches with no leaves. It's very um, interesting to people, and especially children like it. But again, being careful that that sap might cause allergies in, in some people. Buttercups are listed as a dermal toxin as well, um, and there are lots and lots of different buttercups. And some of them are native here and some not. Um, and again, it, it varies be between the different plants on which ones might uh, cause a certain person to have this uh, dermal uh, irritation. 
Um, these plants have that beautiful yellow flower of five petals. Uh, they typically, the buttercups usually grow in a more of a moist habitat, uh, moist soils. Uh, and then they also have this oil, this bitter kind of irritating oil, which can blister skin and if it were eaten uh, could cause some minor stomach illness. So you might see that one uh, listed in the poisonous plant resource, resources as well. I wanted to cover a few plants that are really um, can be quite serious if you uh, touch them. Uh, these are ones that are called photodermal, uh, they cause photodermatitis. And what that means is that you touch that plant and get those oils or that sap on your skin. And then if that skin is in that area is exposed to the sunlight, the sunlight activates those uh, juices and then can cause a rash, a blister, or some kind of severe uh, skin irritation. And some of these can um, be quite severe. Um, the first one is a wild parsnip, also a native plant here. Um, sometimes we call these the bad carrots. <laughs> I'll actually be covering some carrots uh, later that uh, are in the carrot family, not our cultivated carrot that we eat, obviously, but um, the wild parsnips in the carrot family. Um, it has a, a yellow flower, as you can see here in the picture, uh, and has that, that foliage that's very similar to carrot foliage. Again, it's in that family. Um, it looks similar to a Queen Anne's lace or wild or, or um, wild carrot as Queen Anne's lace. If you're familiar with it, often grows along roadsides. But I do see wild parsnip growing all over Illinois. It's uh, um, along a lot of roadsides, and again has those yellow flowers. But if you are uh, sensitive to parsnip, and, and some people are very sensitive, uh, if you touch those leaves and then are exposed to the sun, uh, then you may uh, break out in terrible blisters. Uh, this is the other one that I'm, my sister is very sensitive to, and, and she cannot um, touch this plant at all, or she gets very severe uh, blistering. I've had it a couple of times when I was doing landscape maintenance professionally, um, but uh, it wasn't an, a severe case. But again, th this is a plant that grows about two to five foot tall uh, that you will see growing uh, fairly commonly. Cow parsnip is also a native plant here, and um, it is a much larger. A cow parsnip is a, a biennial, uh, which actually um, a wild parsnip and wild carrot all are biennials, meaning that they complete their life cycle in two seasons. They grow as leaves the first year and then flower the second year. Uh, this cow parsnip has a white flower. Um, which is about 6 to 12 inches across. It's a, a, about twice the size of Queen Anne's lace, actually. A much more stout stem, as uh, maybe you can see in this picture. Uh, but again, uh, exposure to this for some people uh, can cause those blisters when it's exposed to the sun. Um, similar to it, then, is the really awful giant hogweed. And giant hogweed has been hitting the social media uh, quite extensively at times. It seems to come and go. Um, and it has been actually uh, found in Illinois in one very isolated place. Um, but uh, I, I believe that those have been eradicated, or hopefully they still are. Uh, this plant is a, a severe problem. It can cause blindness. It can cause very severe listers and is a public hazard. So please do not grow it as a cultivated plant or get it off the Internet or something like that, which is um, why or how it actually was introduced. Is that, uh, Somebody thought it was a pretty plant, which it is. It's a, it, one of those really exotic plants that grows very tall. It can grow up to 15 feet tall, and these uh, dissected compound leaves that you see here in the picture can get five feet wide. So a very impressive plant, um, but uh, um, with these two and a half foot uh, across white flowers. But again, a very, very um, severe problems can happen if you uh, touch the giant hogweed. Uh, this year, actually last year in 2015, giant hogweed was added to our exotic weed list in Illinois by our Illinois, uh, by our legislature in Springfield, um, meaning that um, it is illegal to sell it in uh, Illinois now. Some lookalikes of those bad carrots then would be the clean ants lace or wild carrot. It is not a poisonous plant. Uh, as you can see here, it's a smaller plant, also a biennial, has more finely dissected leaves. Um, it's about two to five foot tall. Um, actually, a, 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 I think it's a pretty plant. It's a very delicate, lacy, uh, as the name says, uh, type of plant. Angelica is another one that you may see growing. 
uh, and uh, similar um, leaves and as you can see again you can tell it's in that family uh, has kind of greenish flowers and a, a bit of a, a stronger stem so again there are some lookalikes out there let me cover some poisons now ones that um, can be stomach poisons and these substances obviously can be harmful to humans pets animals um, when they have been eaten or ingested in some way um, and I, I do need to make a point that the dose makes the poison. This was always kind of drilled into us when I was in college, but um, you really, if you eat too much of something, even something harmless or nutrition, you can get sick, as you probably know. Um, but in these cases, some of these are, are poisons, but even though they may be poisonous, it still depends on the person's size and how much they eat, whether or not they get sick. Um, as I will show you, some of these you wouldn't have to eat very much at all to be to get very sick or even die, unfortunately. Uh, I've mentioned the potato because um, I'm going to show you several plants that are actually related to potato that are on this list. Um, but uh, the potato, if it has the, you've probably heard before, uh, um, the that if a, you, you should not eat the green skin of a, a potato. And that's true. There's a solanine a toxin that's in the green skin of a potato, which actually is a poison. Um, but uh, the you would have to, as an adult, you would have to eat four and a half pounds of potatoes in one setting in order to have any symptoms from potato poisoning. So it does take quite a large dose. The poisons that I'm going to cover here, or you can see, uh, I'm going to go through the ones that are most poisonous first, the major toxins uh, that I have coated in red, and then we'll go over one that has minor toxicity and then a few that uh, are, are, have some oxalate crystals that we are concerned about. Um, the first one are the most poisonous, and uh, these are the hemlocks, again, some of those bad carrots. Um, the hemlocks, as you can see, there's two different ones. One is native and one to the U.S. and one is native to Europe, but they're both quite toxic. Uh, the water hemlock is um, said to be the most poisonous plant in the northern temperate zone, as you can see here. Uh, I went to a, a first detector program last week, uh, put on, um, you know, at the Extension Office in Springfield, and and. Uh, Chris Evans talked about how the hemlock is the most, you know, a lot of people say are, is the most poisonous plant in Illinois. Uh, you can see that uh, poison juices of hemlock have been used uh, um, in very bad ways in, in our history. The first one then here is poison hemlock. Poison hemlock, uh, by its name, obviously it is a poisonous plant. All parts of this plant are poisonous if it has been, if it's eaten or ingested. And uh, this plant is native to Europe. Uh, it has, um, it, it's hard to identify between these two, the poison hemlock and the water hemlock. What I look for are the purpling, uh, some kind of purpling uh, uh, on the stems. The stems can, are bigger than a Queen Anne's lace. If you look at the picture on the right, it looks a lot like Queen Anne's lace just from that um, distance. But when you get in closer and you look closer, you would see that the stem has these uh, purple spots on it. Um, it's actually a taller plant, assuming it gets to its full size. Uh, it can get up to about seven foot tall. Uh, the leaves uh, actually are, are double or triply pinnately compound, which means there's lots of different uh, little leaflets coming off of that uh, leaf. And, um, and there's specific ways that you can then identify this plant by its uh, leaflets. Uh, it does grow uh, mostly along wet areas, um, along ditches and in streams. We will see it, I see it, um, it and uh, the water hemlock uh, quite a bit each year, especially the water hemlock because it is the native one here. But again, all parts of this plant are poisonous and it, it does not take much of a dose uh, to poison somebody if they were to eat poison hemlock. So we do um, want people to be careful not even, you know, to, to touch it. You might touch it, get that on you, and then, you know, if you were to eat chew gum or, or you know, eat food without washing your hands, you, you could have some exposure in those ways. Water hemlock is the native uh, hemlock here of the, the poisonous ones. As you can see, it also has the purple on the stem. In this case, instead of spots, they're streaks. Similar in size, uh, similar in, in look. The, the, the leaves are just a little bit different um, specifics on them. As you can see, 
um, I've got listed here on the slide in, in, in the handouts that you uh, have. Um, it's similar in flowers, though, and again, grows in very similar habitats. So you would see a water hemlock and poison hemlock, uh, maybe even side by side. Again, all parts of this plant are poisonous, especially the roots, and I emphasize that because it is a wild carrot, so to speak, because it is in the carrot family. And we don't want to um, confuse it with a wild carrot if we're um, you know, wanting to harvest those roots for some reason. Moving out of the bad carrots <laughs> into some other plants that are t stomach poisons or major toxins, uh, foxglove is definitely one of those. Uh, it's interesting that the next two that I cover, foxglove and yew, are actually ones that are extremely poisonous but have also been used um, by our scientists as medicine and they have figured out a way to capture, so to speak, those toxins and, and use them for good in, in medicines, you know, in the, in the, in the proper way. Um, so foxglove is um, a biennial plant, a very beautiful plant. Uh, Digitalis purpurea is the one that I'm covering here is one that has all parts are poisonous and uh, um, again, uh, is, uh, can be a, a very, very toxic plant, so uh, handle it with care. The other one that um, has been used in medicine, actually, is uh, a specific species of the taxus, of the yew. Uh, this is a very common woody plant. You may have it growing outside of your house, uh, along your foundation, or maybe in a hedge in your yard somewhere. A very uh, common plant. You see it uh, very readily available in the, in the nursery trade. It's a very beautiful plant and works well as a hedge. Um, it uh, has those needle leaves. It's an evergreen. Um, it does have these fruits that um, look like little um, you know, fleshy fruits. They actually have uh, toxic bronze seeds inside of those um, little fruits. But the bark and the needles and the seeds are all poisonous, actually. And um, there is a very, very sad story um, that people in western Illinois uh, talk about sometimes. Um, that there was a, a horse show and some Arabian horses were waiting to go into a, an arena at, at, over near Macomb. And um, the horses were browsing on the ewes outside and, uh, and they ate those and then died on the showroom floor. So it is a very strong poison. Um, question over there, are the ewe berries toxic to birds? Uh, no, uh, you know, I can't answer that entirely, but the birds do eat those seeds and, and they do digest them. Um, in some cases, some of the birds um, may eat, you know, some of these seeds and then it's not toxic to them. Um, so I, I can't answer that question specifically, but in some cases, as, as you're maybe mentioning, that in some of these plants, the birds can eat the uh, seeds, whereas others can't. The other one that I mentioned here is, is monk's hood. I took this picture actually when I was hiking in Utah a few years back. It is a, another beautiful plant. Um, it's a tuberous perennial uh, plant in the buttercup family, um, about two to six foot tall. Uh, it's actually mostly native in the northern hemisphere, more in, in a higher elevations. It uh, doesn't grow here real easily, at least I don't find it does, although you may have some, uh, hopefully some of you have some success, but it is a, a beautiful f a plant. Um, but as you can see, the common name is because it's, uh, res its flower uh, resembles a monk's hood, and also from the roots used in the past as a poison bait. Um, all parts of this plant are poisonous, and you should avoid getting the sap on the skin, on your skin, uh, and as you could, you know, maybe ingest it at some point uh, from there. So again, if you get the sap of this plant on your skin, uh, the, it has been reported that you may have some tingling and maybe some numbness that occurs uh, from that sap. A plant that you will find growing, and a lot of people uh, deal with this as a weed, actually, uh, especially some of our farmers in Illinois, are, is the nightshades. So there's two different nightshades. Uh, again, the, these are actually very closely related to potatoes. Um, there's a, a nightshade that has the uh, kind of a, a red berry and one that has a black berry. You can see this one has kind of a, a golden one before they turn. There's 10 different species in Illinois, so um, you usually see the red or the black, but there are others that are here. 
Uh, they all parts of that plant are also poisonous and uh, typically as you can probably guess the berries are the ones that are most commonly ingested especially when those black or red berries are, are ripe they're very uh, shiny and pretty and and look like they should be good to eat but obviously they are um, not <laughs> and so being very very careful with the uh, the plants um, in the nightshade group I did have a book that I like to mention, um, and I, I really like this book. It's called Wicked Plants, and it's by Amy Stewart, and she goes through lots of different plants, so many more than I'm covering today. Um, but she covers the nightshade, and she said that the deadly nightshade performs its dark magic with the help of an alkaloid called atropine, which can cause a rapid heartbeat, uh, confusion, hallucinations, and seizures. And uh, so that, those are some of the symptoms that that plant can cause. Fungi. Uh, uh, we obviously have to be very careful with mushrooms. I always say I don't do fungi, <laughs> uh, other than I do collect morels in the spring. Um, but I do not um, really uh, understand or, or I personally am not able to identify between the good mushrooms and the bad mushrooms. So some of the mushrooms, as you know, are extremely toxic and it doesn't take much at all uh, to uh, cause death. White snake root is kind of an interesting plant in a sad way. Uh, this is also a common plant in Illinois. Um, I see it often along the sides of woods, kind of growing in partial shade. Uh, it is an herbaceous perennial, uh, which has, as you can see, the picture that I took here, um, uh, the leaves that have a, a one to five inch petiole, which um, makes it different from some of our other plants that are similar to it. It has that, as you can see, uh, it's an ageratum, so it has an ageratum type of, uh, of a flower that's white at the top. Not real showy, actually, um, although I, it is if you get really close to it. Uh, but if you were to eat this plant, um, it does have a toxin in it. And the toxin has been shown through history to actually move through milk if cows or goats or other milk-producing animals were to eat it. Uh, and there was, have unfortunately been some episodes in history where those to toxins passed through the milk um, and did kill people. And the most really, I guess, almost what I'd say famous of those would be that um, this was how Abraham Lincoln's mother died. Uh, and again, from A.B. Stewart's uh, book, I'll just mention, uh, read her a little bit here on snake root. Uh, one of the most famous victims of milk sickness was Nancy Hanks Lincoln, mother of Abraham Lincoln. She fought the disease for a week but finally succumbed, as did her aunt and uncle and several other people in the small town of Little Pig Pigeon uh, Creek, Indiana. And so you can see that um, in, in throughout history that it has been a problem. Today, uh, you know, farmers know how to identify it, of course, and try to keep the, our animals away from that pasture. But the, the milk that we drink um, is usually uh, pooled with lots of other um, sources. And so if there were any uh, um, of this in there, it would be so diluted it wouldn't affect us. And of course, our our uh, food is, is tested. So again, I wouldn't worry about it now, but uh, in history, it has been a problem. But um, having said that, um, many years ago when I worked in uh, Fulton County, I've been with Extension 27 years, um, I did have um, a number of horses actually died that summer from eating white snake root and it was confirmed by the U of I vet clinic so again white snake root is a plant to um, be careful. Angel's trumpet. Angel's trumpet is a beautiful plant that some people do grow as an ornamental. It has these very large beautiful uh, trumpet flowers five to seven inches, um, a large egg-shaped fruit. Uh, this is a very toxic plant again a major toxin again in the nightshade family although this is a tropical plant uh, um, i've actually grown it in a container at my house um, and it is a pretty plant um, but uh, again very very poisonous uh, similar to it also in the nightshade family is jimson weed and you may have uh, seen or, or heard of jimson weed it's also a detura which was also what the uh, Angel's trumpet, Angel's trumpet, the species name has changed with the botanist, but uh, at one time it was also a detura. Uh, this is an annual in the nightshade family, um, has kind of a purplish stem, can grow about three to five foot tall, although I usually see it kind of smaller, maybe around three foot. 
uh, has this kind of um, large lobed type of leaf. Uh, again, a pretty flower. It has that same uh, kind of trumpet type of a flower, a four inch tubular flower, a little bit of a, a sweet odor to it. The seed, as you can see here, is a spiny capsule. Actually kind of pretty as well, uh, though it is a spiny uh, type of a seed structure. All parts of this plant are extremely poisonous. And uh, there have been uh, human poisonings even in recent times from um, people either sucking on the flowers or the nectar or eating the seeds for some reason. Unfortunately, there are some um, people who um, have have been known to, to use this deliberately as a hallucinogen, and uh, overdose is common in those cases, and overdose and death is common in those cases. So again, a plant to be careful of, um, usually we consider it more of a weed. Um, but jimson weed, again, in the nightshade family, one of those uh, families that has a number of toxic plants. Here's one of my favorite plants. I always, if you've heard my programs before, I always say I have two favorite plants. I, I love poppies and I love lily of the valley. Uh, but lily of the valleys are actually toxic. Um, they're herbaceous perennial um, and you're all familiar with lily of the valley. Beautiful little white bells, uh, very fragrant, almost look fake to me because they're so waxy and beautiful. Uh, and uh, and I love that odor. It's one of my favorite fragrances. The fruit is kind of an orange-red berry, but again, all parts of that plant are toxic if they're eaten. Again, we're still in the stomach poison part of this program. Um, this plant actually, and this is not a, a show that I watch, but if uh, anybody were to watch the show Breaking Bad, or if they you know anybody who watches Breaking Bad, Apparently, one of the uh, men was poisoned by the berries of the lily of the valley in that show. So, unfortunately, the lily of the valley made the um, Hollywood <laughs> um, circuit at some point. Moving into the minor toxicity plants, uh, this is pokeweed. Pokeweed is a, a very beautiful plant. Um, it is also considered toxic, but it depends on the size of the plant. Um, when you it is actually considered edible if you eat it at the right growing stage and you prepare it in just the right way. And I don't know how to do that, so I'm going to consider it's always uh, poisonous. But those berries look very much like grapes, and so some people will uh, try to eat those and, and, um, and can have some toxicity from that and maybe some stomach problems. Uh, so again, it is I would consider it a poisonous plant. Rhubarb is uh, one of those oxalates. There are three plants I'm covering here that have crystal oxalates in, um, which is an oxalate acid toxin that's in their leaves. Uh, rhubarb obviously is, a, I love rhubarb. It's a wonderful flavor. I, I can eat just the stalks um, straight off the plant or into a rhubarb crisp or a pie. Um, I love those. Um, the rhubarb leaves, however, uh, have those uh, oxalate acid crystals in them, and so um, you've probably heard or uh, that if you should not eat the frozen stalks of a, a rhubarb, and that is a, very true. I know of, my uncle actually knew of someone who ended up in the hospital a couple of years ago from eating um, a, a stalk of a rhubarb that had recently frozen. Uh, usually if it's mushy or it's just not as firm and, and, and you question it, do not eat it. Um, because those toxins can move from the leaves down into the stem um, in those uh, frozen conditions. Two house plants that have that same uh, type of uh, toxin in them, uh, the oxalate crystals would be a dumb cane. It gets its name from that actually, dumb cane, um, and it, uh, because it can actually paralyze the vocal cords and and, and um, could actually those oxalates can burn your, your mouth or throat. All parts are considered toxic. Very common house plant. Often in uh, those little dish gardens you get um, at the florist. Um, and I, I, and I like to grow it. It's a pretty plant actually. It looks kind of like um, some of the aglaonemas, but it's different. It's, it's not an aglaonema. The aglaonema don't have this problem. So this is a Diefenbachia, um, the dumb cane. Um, and again, all parts uh, have this toxin. Similarly, then, would be the Hartleaf philodendron, not the pothos or the devil's ivy. There are two plants that people um, kind of 
put together or call the same thing or call them both philodendrons. But this is the true heartleaf philodendron. Um, this plant um, has the heart shape. It's a green uh, kind of glossy leaf and uh, all parts will have those crystals. Can cause a little bit of dermatitis. Um, all philodendrons actually, um, and there's many different types of philodendrons, all of them have these um, products in, in, in their sap. So again, being careful that they could cause some dermatitis or again, if, if a pet or someone, a child were to eat those, I would um, be concerned about that. So um, using caution, I've never had any problems with dermatitis. I have lots of uh, philodendrons in my house. Let's move into the next category, kind of finishing up here with some allergenic plants. I like this book called Allergy-Free Gardening by Ogren, and he rates lots of different plants in there as uh, ones that are the best um, allergens and the worst allergens. And you can see some examples here. And ragweed and is uh, one of the worst, and a goldenrod, which is often confused uh, because it, it blooms at the same time, can cause allergies in some people as well, although usually the problem is from a ragweed. They're usually flowering at the same time. So uh, those allergens, so be careful with those. Those are the ragweeds that you can see there. Uh, and uh, there's two different ones, a common ragweed and giant ragweed that we typically see in the fall. Some prickly plants then, um, uh, getting away from the stomach poisons, dermals, and, and inhalants. Um, the prickly plants, so just kind of for your own information, there's thorns, spines, and prickles. Thorns are actually modified stems like you see on this honey locust. A spine would be a modified leaf or a stipule like you see on this Osage orange or hedge tree. And then a prickle would be where there's an outgrowth of the skin of the a leaf maybe or the bark like you see on this holly. Cactus are the most obvious ones that have uh, spines or, or, in this case, thorns. Um, the, a punch of cactus, so the, the prickly pear cactus, I have lots of those growing in my yard uh, here in Mason County. Uh, they grow in the sand of Mason County and in uh, some other parts of Illinois as well. And then, of course, there are lots of other types of cactus that have those thorns as well. Two different locusts uh, in two different genus that have um, uh, thorns. One is the honey locust. Uh, you, it's, um, there is a thornless honey locust. That's what you're seeing on the right picture. That's in my yard. It's a seedless thornless honey locust. Um, so it is actually a male tree and does not have those big, large, uh, messy seed pods. And it also doesn't have any thorns. So it has been um, you know, selected for those features. But the straight species of the honey locust does have these monstrous, uh, very treacherous thorns on it. The black locust in the Robinia genus, uh, Robinia pseudocasia, uh, actually are, um, you can see these are um, little spines that are happening at the nodes of the stems. Um, they can also hurt you if you were to grab that to do some pruning or, or whatever. Um, but again, it's a, a different plant, a different kind of a poke, so to speak. Many different thistles out there that have uh, prickles on their leaves, and they may have little hairs that can poke or um, little, uh, you know, the prickles on, on the flower structures and, as well. Uh, two very common thistles you'll find in Illinois are bull thistle and musk thistle. Uh, bull thistle is much hairier uh, if you look at that picture of its leaves are both biennial, so the first year they grow as leaves, as you can see in the bottom picture, and uh, then the second year they will bolt and send up a flower and flower like you're seeing in the top pictures. The bull thistle never opens more than that. It just has a few little beautiful purple hairs coming out of the top like that. Um, and then on the musk thistle opens much bigger and can get heavy and nod over, also called nodding thistle. Um, you'll see those very commonly. Musk thistle is actually on our noxious weed list in Illinois, meaning we're required by law to control it if we have it on land that we own or, or are working on. Bull thistle is not noxious in Illinois. Some berries actually have some thorns on them as well, or prickles, uh, um, depending on the plant. Um, and anybody who has picked black rad raspberries or blackberries uh, or even gooseberries may have encountered, unfortunately, those thorns. And you can get thornless ones as well if you're growing them domestically. <laughs> Finally, the last plant that I'll cover is a stinging plant. Uh, this one will sting you much like a bee stings you. 
and um, maybe some of you have encountered this. The stinging nettles, and there are other nettles that don't sting, but the sting nettles are ones that are little stinging hairs all up and down the stem, um, will cause a stinging sensation, really does feel like you've been stung like a bee and can cause a rash. And it lasts for uh, quite a long time, maybe an hour. Uh, I've been stung many times, and uh, it, it is very uncomfortable. Uh, you will find these plants most commonly growing in wetlands along uh, streams and creeks in Illinois, and so you may have encountered it in those locations. Uh, you can see the stinging hairs on the stem, and if you're walking past it, you can very carefully grab the leaves. The stinging hairs are not on the leaves, and pull the plant away so you don't touch those stems as you walk past. Finishing up here just with some advice. Obviously, we want to prevent poisoning exposures. Know your plants. Obviously, I'm trying to show you the most uh, naughty and nasty of them all here. Um, always be careful with children and pets, uh, of course, um, and consider removing plants that maybe they would uh, be exposed to inappropriately. Uh, if you're handling some of these plants and you're sensitive, obviously be careful with those as well. And never eat plants or mushrooms unless we know that they are safe. Um, and the other thing is I want to make sure you all have the uh, Poison Control Center number. Obviously you can dial 911, but if you are unsure in any way, um, make sure that you uh, get the person to a medical facility right away and, and call the poison, call the poison control center, 911, and they and they can uh, help you. Um, if you think it's a plant, um, sometimes it's good to maybe take a quick cell phone picture of the plant, or if if you know you're not worried about picking it, um, to pick it safely and, and take it with you as long as assuming it won't expose other people. Um, so obviously being careful with that, but uh, make sure that you are careful with these plants and, and uh, have those um, emergency uh, routes available. Other resources that I really like, uh, there are lots of different poisonous plant um, websites out there. I particularly like Cornell's. Um, our University of Illinois one is actually pretty good. Um, it's from the vet school at the University of Illinois. They also have a, a vet, uh, the vet school has a poisonous plant garden, although I don't know if it's been kept up in the last few years, but I think it's still there and I've been to it and it was uh, interesting to see. And then you can see there's some others as well. The last link there is uh, Illinois Wildflowers. I, I just really like this website. It gives uh, lots of information about our, our flowers and that's where I got a lot of that information about how to identify between poison hemlock and water hemlock if you want more information about that. Uh, here's my contact information, and um, I guess I'll go ahead and start answering questions now. I'm going to go ahead and go through, and then I'll go back to my contact information. But um, just to make sure you know uh, that all of our Four Season Gardening programs are, are recorded, and they will be available after the Thursday night session on uh, our YouTube channel. And so you can um, get to it in this way or uh, certainly invite your friends and family to come listen to all of our programs on our YouTube as well. So questions. I have a question here on advice regarding invasive wild mustard. And um, yeah, the um, garlic mustard, I assume, is what you're referring to. Garlic mustard is, um, is very invasive, has pretty much taken over many of our woodland areas in Illinois and beyond. It's a problem in my woods. Uh, uh, I don't have any magic answers for that. Um, uh, some uh, people have had some success burning it. Um, there's lots of people who have pulling days, garlic mustard uh, festivals, so to speak, and go out and pull it. Um, most people, I think, do um, pull it. There are some herbicides that could be used. Um, I've been actually mowing it. The, the One of the keys is which is almost impossible, but one of the keys is you really have to try to get all those seeds and, and make sure that the seeds um, do not um, come into your, you know, don't let the plant go to seed, in other words. Uh, each plant has hundreds of seeds, and actually uh, the seeds mature very, very quickly, so almost immediately they um, will mature and, and can germinate, and so uh, try to mow it maybe before it flowers and goes to seed. Questions in Joe Davies, is jewel weed effective in treating other stinging plants other than nettles? And I don't 
I don't know the answer to that. Jewelweed grows in the same habitat as stinging um, nettle, um, and, uh, and I don't know if that's a, a good treatment or not. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, yes, the Wicked Plant book. Um, her name is Amy Stewart. I'll go ahead and write that in here. Uh, and her book is called Wicked Plants. And, yeah, I do like that, that book as well. Other questions out there? Yeah, again, Knox County has a question, will you plants kill deer? And, and I really can't answer that either. <laughs> um, I, I don't know uh, the answer to that, um, but I'm sure we could find out uh, specifically. Ecotype would be the um, genetically they have a similar uh, genes in them um, between, so they're, they're very extremely closely related, so to speak, if you think about it in, in really simple terms. So an ecotype would be um, that the, the poison oak is, is really maybe a type of poison ivy. Moonflower, uh, again, we're going to get into the problem with common names here. The uh, question is, is jimson weed the same as moonflower? And I would say no, because the moonflower I grew last summer is actually um, a morning glory, <laughs> um, whereas jimson weed is, is definitely not that completely different plant. Um, but again, some people might call it that. It's a white flower, and, and some uh, people do, um, you know, the white flowers are, are more visible at night. Uh, than other colors, but and typically I would say that it's not what I would call it. Any other questions, comments? Well, if not, I will stick around for a while. If there are some questions, I'll stick around for about five minutes or so. Um, if not, I certainly thank you all very much, and I hope that you all uh, learn something and, and try to avoid that poison ivy and some of those other plants. Thank you. Oh, the you, uh, Candace, I, I really don't know the answer to that. We could probably find out, uh, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure at all. Thank you, Rhonda. Yeah, very good. You. Okay, the question was moonflower and angel's trumpet. Again, I do not consider moonflower angel's trumpet, but some people might. Um, again, that's a problem with common names. Jimson weed, trumpet creeper. Um, oh, yeah, jimson weed and is moonflower. Second question is trumpet creeper, creeper the same as trumpet vine? Yes. Yeah, a lot of people do call it trumpet vine. Angel's trumpet is a detura, yes.